and sit there. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So as we're getting ready, I'd like to welcome all of you um, to our second meeting of the Institute of Noetic Sciences uh, Metro DC Community Group. This is a wonderful opportunity for us to open a space for thoughtful conversations about the nature of consciousness and the role of consciousness in these times and uh, our understanding both conceptual and practical about the development of consciousness in, in these difficult times. Um, and so just to remind you, uh, this is a new community group that just got started. Uh, we are affiliated with the Institute of Noetic Sciences, which was uh, founded by Apollo 14 astronaut Edgar Mitchell in 1974 after he came back from uh, his uh, mission because he was so moved <coughs> by this transformative experience that he had of looking at the Earth from outer space and realizing both the, the beauty the interconnectedness of, of this, uh, this planet um, in every way, energetically, uh, and in every way, and realizing that we need to be assisted to wake up to that loving energy that in fact unites us. And uh, so he founded this institute which is dedicated to studying how consciousness interacts with the world, and uh, what it means to be human. So the Institute of Noetic Sciences uh, really works and does its research and education at the intersection of science and spirituality. And so uh, a number of us who have been gathering and talking about the role of spirituality in human growth and development and health and well-being decided that this may be an appropriate way to open uh, our circle a little bit more and invite people here in Metro DC who come from different backgrounds. They're here energy practitioners, holistic health practitioners, there's people from different faith backgrounds. And of course the Baha'i uh, Center here in Metro DC has been gracious enough to open its doors for us uh, because as many of you he heard me uh, say last time, my own orientation to spirituality and the intersection between spirituality and science is inspired by um, the Baha'i understanding since the 19th century, which really emphasizes this intersection between science and spirituality, uh, global citizenship, global education, and, and the evolution of consciousness. So it felt to me that this would be an appropriate and welcoming place, as it has been. So I'm very glad to welcome you back here again to our second meeting. Uh, we are in the formative stage as, as a community group. Uh, so IONS, the Institute of Noetic Sciences, has community groups all over the world. If uh, you decide to go to the website, you'll see that it has community groups really all over the US and, and the world. People form their own groups. They decide to organize and to gather however frequently they decide. And they form also a focus. And so the focus of this group, at, when it first came together, was uh, on heart-mind coherence. And of course, um, our slant with uh, developing this focus was the fact that all of us have been gathering and talking more about what it means to be healthy in these difficult times, what it means to experience health in these difficult times, to promote health in our families, in our children, um, in the people that we love, and, and so heart-mind coherence seems to speak to, to that concept of health. And so that's our focus for now. Okay, so the group, of course, is evolving. It's a community group, so it will evolve. We uh, thought we would begin with a series of uh, lectures, which I would uh, put together and offer um, as a spiritually inspired psychologist who works all day long, every day with health and well-being and what that means in, in this very difficult context so that we can um, be exposed to a language and a framework that brings our conversations a little bit more together. And uh, at some point, um, this conversation will grow in, in different directions. Uh, so each next gathering is our feeling our way forward in, in terms of how it most makes sense to uh, proceed and also 
for now me also offering for part of the gathering a lecture series that is structured around psycho-spiritual education. What I shared with all of you last time is that my own motivation for starting this is the realization that um, at this most difficult time in the world, we radically lack the kind of empowering and systematic psycho-spiritual understanding that can help us feel empowered in terms of dealing with difficulties, dealing with hardship, dealing with um, just social realities and historical realities all around us. Um, and so my sense is that, that uh, as individuals in our private space, we, we deal with a lot of disempowerment. And it's really important to open up spaces where these things are addressed in a more systematic way. So that has been my motivation. Um, so as we are getting started, what I'd like to suggest is a little exercise so that we can actually become centered and also get a feel for who is here. Of course, we have a lot of people here. It seems we have about 30 people. Um, so it's going to be difficult for us to introduce ourselves to one another. But at the same time, it really is important to begin to have a feel for who is part of this community group, who's coming, who's interested, and, and what is uh, the, the wealth that we bring together. And so I thought that maybe we could start with a way that may seem a little strange, but is uh, actually very consistent with uh, the focus on the nature of mind uh, tonight. So I was thinking that it would be nice if we could do a little centering exercise. I would ask all of us if we could uncross our arms and legs and feel ourselves really squarely planted on with our feet on the floor and centered in our seated position. And I would ask that we put our right hand on our heart area and actually press, make contact, feel that contact as you press, and take a few minutes to quietly become connected to what is the love or longing that brings you here tonight. And we can take a few minutes to become aware of what feels true for each of us in this moment and then we can go around and in a very brief fashion literally just say your name your occupation and just name the love or longing that brings you here tonight so just in one sentence no more but we want to connect to our reality we want to connect to our truth and, and bring it into this room and so I will now be quiet and allow all of us to center. Uh, very, very happy to have such a wonderful full gathering for a second time in a row. Of course, there is no surprise in the fact that we all are hungry for spaces for meaningful conversations about uh, the issues of the times, as one of you said, and about the place in, for each one of us in not just understanding these issues in safe environments, but also um, realizing more deeply how we can uh, be conducive to the kind of change that we want to see in the world. So clearly, there's a lot that we can learn together. There's a lot of capacity in this room. And uh, just the nature of a two-hour meeting uh, implies that we can't all get to know each other at uh, the first or the second gathering. But it is my hope that as we keep gathering every two weeks and the conversation deepens and expands, we will get to know each other and uh, really begin to learn more and more from each other. Um, today I wanted to 
talk about the nature of mind and also give us an opportunity to also talk to each other about what you're hearing and explore. Uh, as you know, uh, at our first meeting, we began by uh, trying to find, uh, trying to open a conversation on what may be a deeper understanding of health as a psychological and spiritual coherence. And of course, uh, what do we mean by, a co by coherence? The word coherence is generally used to indicate something that holds together, that, that, that seems to um, make sense and hold together. And so psychological and the experience of psychological and spiritual coherence is actually uh, something very hard to come by in a very discordant context and age and, and global time with all kinds of, of conflicts and tensions that we're all experiencing. So this is really an exploration. How can we, in these difficult times, move towards greater coherence of heart, mind, and body in a social context? What does that mean? It apparently is a process, a process that looks a little different for each one of us. But what is the knowledge, what is the understanding that, is, that can assist us along uh, th this road and how can we assist each other. The love of community was also a very clearly stated goal here that, that brings t people together and the need for a safe community where we can explore this movement towards greater coherence. So um, today I'd like to move to the idea of coherence from the point of view of the question, who are we? It is, of course, a fundamental question of being. But when we think about the human mind, when we think about who we are, we're really coming close to the nature of things that, that really shape our way of being and experiencing ourselves and our lives. So there's a need for a lot of request, uh, reflection on this fundamental question of, of who we are. And of course, when we ask this question, we want to understand who we are beyond the languages that shape and scaffold us. Remember, we talked a lot last time about languages that really scaffold our consciousness from the first day of conception and continue to scaffold the way we think, consciously and unconsciously, uh, for the length of our lives. But who are we beyond these languages that scaffold us? Who are we beyond our identities and roles? Because on some level, as a few of you shared in small groups last time, we have a sense that there is a lot more to our experience of being human than we can put into words. Um, in fact, in a couple of the smaller groups, people uh, shared last week that even though a number of you find that religious languages appear to speak less and less to the human experience at this time in the world, a number of you shared that you continue to go to religious services and various uh, religious or spiritual occasions because every once in a while you experience <coughs> catching a glimpse of something, catching a glimpse of something more that is really hard to, uh, to put into words. Um, of course, we are educated to believe that our brains create our minds, that our minds are really the result of the firing of neurons, um, and that to the extent to which we can talk about consciousness, this is really um, an epiphenomenon of the firing of neurons, essentially. And that when our brains die, life ends. But we do sense that there is more to our minds than simply the firing of neurons. There is a nobility to our minds that is rarely acknowledged, as the 20th century really has shrunk all human aspiration to behaviors and particular specializations. And that's something that has both advanced our knowledge significantly 
and in some ways has left us feeling reduced. Um, I found it very amusing that my profession has uh, a colloquial name, shrink. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> apparently, <laughs> when people come with their suffering, we are supposed to shrink their suffering into some kind of manageable behavior learning uh, that can set them happily back on their way. And that is just an illustration of how we've come to think about the, the nobility of the human experience and the nobility and complexity of the human mind, both highly specialized, but in, in, in other ways also rather shrunk. Um, and so the end result of that is we tend to feel weakened. On some level, we know that the life of mind the way it has been defined by the modern age is rather small. There is a smallness to it. There's a smallness to much research. There's a smallness to much science. Surely there's more to the life of mind. The science of the particular has lost sight of the whole person. Religion, the one human um, reality that has always spoken to the human heart and has always affirmed that consciousness is eternal has also become quite dogmatic and reductionist and external in uh, very much as dogmatic and as external as physicalist, materialist science. In fact, they're really competing. In, in that realm. And so more and more people are finding that to be an equally unsatisfying experience. These dominant paradigms of understanding of a human being render people deeply doubting themselves. And that's what I see in the therapy room every day. People often harbor very negative beliefs about themselves, uh, profound doubts about their ability to overcome their limitations, their struggles, um, their addictions, if you will, uh, that they're actually capable of growth and transformation. And that applies to people who happen to have religious beliefs as well. In private, we all doubt that we really are capable of, uh, of growth and transformation. And that has a lot to do with the kind of dominant paradigms that frame the languages we're constantly internalizing about who we are, what we are. However, um, in this wonderful age of information, we're learning very rapidly uh, about a lot of experiences that neuroscience is fundamentally not able to explain. And of course, we know that we've been in the decade of the brain, and it is the time of neuroscience, as neuroscience is going to change therapy, it's going to change treatment, and it is, the knowledge is changing a lot of things and how we do many things. At the same time, however, I'd like to share with you uh, the experience that uh, my husband and I had last weekend, attending a workshop which was given by a neurosurgeon uh, by the name of Dr. Eben Alexander, who was a Harvard-trained neurosurgeon who spent the first 54 years of his life, or maybe 30 out of those, uh, <laughs> practicing neurosurgery and teaching students that any experiences that people report as part of death and dying are nothing but hallucinations with the um, dying brain and the firing of neurons. Until at the age of 54, he contracted uh, an E. coli meningitis, which is extremely rare in adults, tends to happen in children, as he shared with us. And within 24 hours, all eight areas of his neocortex shut down, mm -hmm. and his brain was so affected that even the brain stem was damaged. And those of you who know enough physiology know that this is the most primitive part of the brain. When the brain stem is affected, you know the whole brain has been really shut down. So he found himself in coma for seven days. And after the third day of his being in coma, his colleagues and now treating physicians uh, and, and neurosurgeons uh, informed the family that 
if he were to come back, he would not have access to any of his uh, knowledge or understanding. He would come back essentially as a vegetable. On day seven, he came back completely. And within a few weeks, I, I believe he said within eight weeks, was fully able to restore his memory, all of his sophisticated knowledge and training. But then what happened was that he was facing some years of profound soul searching and struggles, having to integrate what he experienced uh, in those seven days into his understanding of life and reality, which in no way could make sense of what he had seen. The essence of what he shared with us uh, was his realization coming back, is that the only part of us that is real is consciousness. In fact, consciousness is eternal and it evolves. The purpose of life here and he also shared having traversed multiple spiritual realms beyond this one. And he described the purpose of life across all these realms that he traversed as the evolution of consciousness. The evolution of consciousness in a particular direction towards the realization of the oneness of reality, of our interdependence, the oneness of that universal core, that universal mind, which I will refer to as the unknowable essence of all life. And that apparently is a journey in which we are all completely interconnected, not just on this realm, but across every, every realm of spiritual reality. As you can tell, that is such a profound and different view of what is real and what life is that this man spent the next eight years um, traveling, lecturing, talking to scientists, talking to people of faith, talking to people of all walks of life and really trying to make sense of this understanding. So it was very moving to be in his presence. And if this group becomes strong enough and active enough, and we decide that we want to invite him here, we're able to do that if we have at least 50 people who are willing to uh, um, actually pay a fee because that's how he makes his living now. He travels around the world and he gives these talks. Um, so this is definitely a possibility and he's uh, interested. I talked with him about that possibility already. Um, so that's something that we can talk again about, but I, I just submit this for your consideration now. Uh, at the workshop, which was a, a five-hour uh, five workshop on Saturday and a two-hour introductory the night before, um, so it was a rather in-depth workshop, he worked with his uh, partner, Karen Newell, who uh, works for the Monroe Institute. And uh, at the Monroe Institute, she has been developing... Um, sound frequencies that induce through very particular variations in, in, in hertzes, induce deep meditative states um, which serve as portals into deeper awareness of reality. The, the way that they connected with each other was that when he uh, at some conference encountered her uh, sound creations and guided meditations, he was struck to recognize in those sounds tremendous similarity with what he reported as divine, undescribable melodies that served as the vibrations that lifted his soul beyond this realm and as he was traversing, as his soul was traversing realms. Now, this is not a unique report. There are many reports of uh, people dying and people who've had near-death experiences who report divine music 
incomparable to anything that we have heard here as associated with the transition into the realms beyond. Um, as I was sharing this with my 18-year-old daughter who has uh, become, um, as she entered the, the front ranks of elite academic education first year and became rapidly very disillusioned with the uh, really two-dimensional and materialistic nature of even the most advanced learning that she's exposed to, she plunged into reading and studying uh, Baha'i spiritual sources like never before, <laughs> really now trying to find everything that's missing in her education. And when I was sharing this particular experience of Dr. Eben Alexander, she said, oh, haven't you noticed, mom, that in so many of the Baha'i spiritual writings, there's a constant reference to divine melodies. And I thought, you're right, divine melodies. Give it to a fresh young mind to notice. So it was remarkable to listen to Dr. Eben Alexander. I won't go into many more details. If we decide to have him here, uh, I asked if we could shorten the workshop and have it a four hour workshop in one day because people here are busy and more than that probably would not be manageable. But if we have 50 people and uh, this space is able to host us at a particular time, we can think about that. One of the things that um, I'd like to share that he also shared is that there's a lot of evidence in clinical neuroscience, and of course he's now traveling and talking to colleagues, that mind does not equal brain. And in fact, brain does not produce mind. Uh, amongst some of those interesting evidences, uh, is the fact that memories are not only not stored in any one particular place in the cortex, but despite how much scientists have been tampering with the context in order to try to see if they can remove memories, no amount of tampering with the context can remove our memories. <coughs> so a way to think about this, of course, is to think about the holographic universe that I spoke about last, the, our first lecture, that David Baum suggested is a way to think about reality. A holographic universe where a holon, a unit of the whole, contains the complete blueprint of the whole. Um, I won't go further into that, but it clearly is a whole different way of, an, of thinking about mind and consciousness. Uh, and as he pointed out, free will cannot be found in the physical substance of the brain, not anywhere. Um, other events, uh, other phenomena that he was uh, citing that I think I'd like to very briefly mention is uh, the phenomenon of terminal lucidity. As people are dying and their brains are shutting down, 90% of the time, even in demented patients, what we or people with brain metastatic cancer, we see a level of lucidity appearing in the final moments, which simply cannot be accounted for by the state of the brain. Then, of course, there's all the research on non-local consciousness, uh, telepathy, um, and not just in identical twins, but way beyond that. And I will probably focus another lecture on more of the science of, of, of these phenomena. So for now, and, and many of you are probably well familiar with much of this science. So for now, we'll just move on. Of course, the placebo effect is a very interesting phenomenon. In the mid-1950s, Dr. Beecher, during the Second World War, uh, when he ran out of morphine, was forced to, to, to tell the soldiers by injecting them with something, uh, possibly water, that they will now feel better. And mm -hmm. consistently, the soldiers, in fact, felt pain-free. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there's many, many studies of the placebo effect that, that show the power of mind over, uh, over brain and over body. But at this point, uh, we can start asking ourselves the question, what is mind? Really, how can we begin to think about mind? 
One thing is quite apparent. Mind is not just what the brain does. In fact, from the point of view of Dr. Eben Alexander, mind creates brain. Mind creates all of the physical substrates of our experience of reality on this plane. That's a very radical statement. And we won't go there today, but I'll go with a more middle-of-the-road scientist who's doing really very interesting research. Again, Harvard-trained psychiatrist Dr. Daniel Siegel, one of my favorite colleagues in the field who's been working on the nature of mind with an interdisciplinary team for a good 10 years now at uh, uh, University of California. And what he is saying is that mind is clearly um, a very complex phenomenon which emerges from a higher level of system functioning than simply what happens in the skull. In fact, when we look at the nature of mind, we, he identifies three facets of mind. One, of course, is our consciousness, our ability to be aware. Michael Singer, in his very famous book, uh, The Untethered Soul, calls that the inner witness, our ability to bear witness to all the ranting talk of our inner roommate, to all of our mental debates, to all of the things that we construct and experience, there is a consciousness and awareness that is present and able to bear witness. <coughs> and that is a fundamental aspect of mind. On a different level, as a different facet, mind also represents a flow a flow of information and energy. It's an ongoing process, a flow of information and energy, where information is anything that symbolizes something other than itself. So a stone is not information. Language is information. And energy, of course, is our capacity to carry out action. So the flow of energy and information is a fundamental facet of mind. And this flow happens within the whole of us, within our embodiment, and it also happens interpersonally, between and among us. This flow of energy and information is being shared right here, right now, among all 30 plus of us. Even though I am the only one who's talking, all of you are part of this flow of energy and information. Um, so that's another aspect of mind that is fundamental and, uh, and very complex. And then the third facet of mind, of course, is the subjective texture of our lived life within consciousness. Mind in each of us has a very subjective texture, unique, uniquely subjective texture that um, most likely has something to do with what we spoke about last time as the unique nature of our souls, that unique spiritual essence that we appear to be first before all levels of genetics and socio-environmental conditioning becomes activated there appears to be to each human being a unique spiritual essence that we refer to as soul. And perhaps the very subjective texture of our lived experience of life and consciousness must have something to do with that. So we have these three facets, information and energy flow, consciousness as a capacity for awareness, and then of course the subjective texture of our lived experience. So mind is a very complex system. And of course, what we know from systems theory is that complex systems self-organize. So mind self-organizes as a complex system. So mind is a self-organizing emergent property of energy and information flow happening within us and between us. 
Again, it is a self-organizing emergent property of energy and information flow. So mind is nothing static. That is a whole, this is a whole different way of thinking about mind and consciousness than the times that we relied on intelligence tests in order to understand <laughs> what mind each of us, what capacity of mind each of us brings to the table. Apparently, there's very little that's static about mind. It is an emergent property of uh, energy and information flow. And so the more that we commune, and here comes your love of community that brings you here, the more that we commune, the more that we share, the more that this flow expands. And so the mind grows. Individual mind and consciousness evolves as do we all together. If that is the case, and if mind is self-organizing, then apparently essential to the life of mind is the kind of downtime, reflective time that allows mind to self-organize when we're not caught in linear activities, competing against time, playing with our gadgets, trying to constantly get ahead of the information flow that's coming our way. So, as any self-organizing system, mind needs that quiet, reflective time to self-organize. No wonder, in this age of almost universal education, we have the highest percentage ever in anxiety and depression in the world and mental dysfunction. I think I mentioned last, uh, last time that the World Health Organization um, has um, declared a decade of global mental health and we're in the midst of that decade as that being the most pressing uh, and most urgent issue of the time right now. Um, the, the way that we live, the priorities that we have, the time for reflection, for spiritual practice that allows mind to self-organize has shrunk and is typically very much last on our lists. Optimal self-organizing involves two processes. The process of differentiation, differentiating elements, and the paired with it process of integration, the linking of the differentiated elements into ever more complex systems. So differentiation and integration are the, the dual processes of the evolution of mind. So essentially, and in the chart that I offered in my first lecture, you saw integration being consistently used as um, a synonym of well-being, of health. And so Dr. Siegel has noticed that individuals who display mental suffering manifest impaired integration. And this impaired integration is characterized by two phenomena. One is too much rigidity or too much chaos. So the differentiated elements are so rigidly defined that further differentiation and integration cannot happen, or there, there, there appears to be no capacity or reduced capacity to link, to establish the links between the differentiated elements. And here I'd like to share with all of you, I have actually only 20 copies, so hopefully some of you can, can share, but I do have 20 copies of the picture of how he describes um, the human mind as an ongoing river of integration that is limited by the banks of chaos and rigidity. And as I share this with you, I encourage you to think, and I'm going to ask you to actually spend a little bit of time talking to a neighbor about what strikes you as you look at this picture of the river of integration which will pass around in a moment with the two banks of chaos and rigidity. This is the experience of all of our lives. There are moments we know when we 
become particularly stuck in our thinking or in some con concepts or some um, ideas that seem very central to our thinking, ideological, possibly religious or spiritual, intellectual, uh, professional, uh, we, we hit against our own tendency for rigidity. Uh, but the discomfort of that um, hopefully induces reorienting towards deeper integration. And on the other side, we also experience so much chaos uh, um, in our environments and with everything that we're trying to integrate that sometimes we feel frazzled, fragmented and utterly unable to integrate. And so actually this river of integration and the hitting against chaos and rigidity is typical for all of our experience um, but we can think about it in, in deeper ways when it comes to conditions of mental suffering. Frankly, the whole uh, diagnostic manual of the American Psychiatric Association and all the conditions, it's a very thick book, can be described as variations in uh, chaos and rigidity. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to um, take a little bit of time now, hand these out, please share, we only have 20 copies and I'd like everybody to be able to have some access uh, to, uh, to, these, to this picture and find yourself a partner with whom you can share what strikes you. Uh, interesting observations can uh, have come up and uh, I'm sure you also need a lot more time to really uh, process the significance of this simple little chart. But if a few of you would like to make some comments on what really stood out for you, any, anything that you found particularly interesting that somebody observed, uh, any insight that anybody feels you'd like to share, it'll be great for just a few moments. We can hear from just a few people. Sir, please. Uh, and please tell, uh, tell us your name again so we can start remembering names. Well, I'm John Craig. I'm a Steve Jobs fan. But he always said it's the crazies who bring new things into the world, great innovations. <laughs> I always thought that you kind of have to be half crazy. If you're totally crazy, you're overcome by chaos. It's one of our group members was saying she was dealing with some psychotherapy patients. I've dealt with schizophrenics in clinical settings. Wow. They're overwhelmed. And the internet is like that. You're flooded with all this information. It's too much. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you're really rigid or sane, you know, um, then you're, you're not having much of a, break, a breakdown that, mm. that you have a breakthrough. So Thank you, that's wonderful. So breakdowns are the path to breakthrough. Uh, let's remember that in our darker moments when none of us want to be in the middle of a breakdown. <laughs> but it's a good reminder. <laughs> okay, thank you, sir. Anybody else? I want to add that. Um, uh, please, your name. Oh, Shirley. So. Shirley, yes, thank um, you. Uh, we were talking, we were looked up at some of the words above and saw that metaphor about a choir. And so, as I'm thinking about that more, it feels like the chaos is just noise and mm. the rigidity is kind of a silence. But if you allow a movement, you get a melody, you bring it all together. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Let's take one more comment if there's anything that somebody's moved to share. Did you find this productive? Did you find this chart interesting? Yep. Very thought provoking. I Doctor, can we, can we just briefly say, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I That's a, please, no, nothing, I'm not oh, saying anything. My name important. is Jessica. Nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we were reflecting on, on um, the fact that anxiety is like an experience of chaos. Yes. Mm -hmm. And yes. depression is an experience of rigidity. Very true. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, we also have to acknowledge that any time we get locked on one bank, we also have glimpses of, of the opposite bank as well. So in, in the rigidity of depression, there are moments of extreme anxiety and vice versa. But that's, that's a great observation. Thank you. So as you can see, uh, this is uh, abundant food for thought in terms of how we think 
please. The bank of rigidity. Yeah. I think is uh, that's the bank of reaction. Ah. Because reactions, at least in my life, my reactions, which came out of a certain rigid belief on how things should be or had to be, usually are reactive mm. and rigid and usually not very helpful in the flow of your one life mm. or others. I'm sure we can all relate to that nature of reactivity. It is usually propelled by a rigid belief in the moment, although sometimes people react uh, from a sense of complete overwhelm, when the system is overwhelmed, so it can also come from an experience of chaos. Um, it's, it's interesting how both sides of, of this spectrum really are connected to each other. So um, there's a lot that we can do here, but uh, Obviously, these meetings will grow and unfold, and we'll keep coming back to these uh, themes with more depth. Um, for today, I just wanted to take a few further steps and give you an opportunity to reflect again. So, uh, as people begin to move towards integration and experience healing, they feel the following experiences which are actually described right above your chart which is why I left the text there so you actually have them people feel connected as they experience more integration <coughs> they feel open they feel harmonious they feel more receptive they feel more engaged they feel more noetic you can see all of them listed noetic meaning having a sense of knowing they also feel more compassionate and more empathic. And Dr. Daniel Siegel is a, a lover of acronyms, so he quickly noticed that the acronym of these is coherence. So when, when, people, <laughs> when people move towards <laughs> integration, they experience more coherence, and coherence, in fact, can be described as feeling more connected, more open, more harmonious, more receptive, more engaged, more noetic, as in having a sense of knowing and grasping and understanding things, uh, more compassionate and more empathic. So uh, you have a very valuable information on this little sheet, and I suggest you all can write it to the side as the, the, the all of these come together in the acronym coherence and it's also a way for us to think about coherence so the last a few minutes of my talk I'd like to spend focusing on what are languages that foster coherence in our environments greater coherence apparently languages that foster the coherence of mind are essential at this time in the world. And we have to really pause for a moment and ask yourselves, ourselves, what are these languages and, and uh, what is the effect of a lot of other languages around us? Um, and so, clearly, the language of physicalist, materialist science does not foster coherence. We've already spoken about that. The language of science, which is still a very dominant paradigm, in fact promotes inadvertently, unintentionally, more of a sense of fragmentation of mind, which is very characteristically the experience of a modern age, fragmented minds. And even though we have a growing understanding of this, of course, paradigms, paradigm shifts happen slowly, and it's hard work. And the, the, um, the powers that are invested in the current status of science are still very strong. But as many, many, many of us scientists and scholars are working on the outside, including Dr. Eben Alexander himself and, and many others, um, we can see that the time is coming when this paradigmatic shift is really underway because it is untenable for us to hold on to a science that so fragments 
our sense of reality and the human experience. So we're really at the cusp of a paradigm shift, and that paradigm shift is in the direction of a spiritual understanding of reality. That kind of spiritual awakening is apparent and evident all over the planet. And of course, our gathering here is just one small example of that, and all of your interests and reasons to be here are one small example of that. But we certainly know that the kind of spirituality and spiritual understanding that is uh, going to bring for all of us greater coherence is very different than the dogmatic religious languages that are rapidly growing the incoherence in, mm -hmm. in the world. And I referred to it last time as the Tower of Babel in terms of different paradigms, different dogmatic belief systems that are pitted against each other and are not coherent. Um, and that really create greater and greater fragmentation. So clearly the spirituality that is emerging out of uh, the hearts and souls of people of all convictions and all religious backgrounds is a spirituality that is characterized by coherence. And so the language, the spiritual language of coherence is what we all need and we have to ask ourselves where do we find that language in our lives every day because you're exposed to languages of incoherence all day long every day so where in your lives where in your days do you become exposed to languages that foster coherence of course that is typically the spiritual practices of prayer, reflection, meditation, reading of sacred texts that provide daily opportunity for differentiation and integration and deeper coherence. They are, in fact, these spiritual practices, as people are finding out more and more, are the daily prevention against rigidity and house, chaos. So structuring our lives around spiritual practices is really essential prevention in this age. Um, and I, I'd like to quote here a, um, a short paragraph from uh, Baha'u'llah's gleanings, which had really struck me. If any man were to meditate on that which the scriptures sent down from the heaven of God's holy will have revealed, he would readily recognize that their purpose is that all men shall be regarded as one soul. I found that quote really stunning. That if we were to meditate on that which all the scriptures that were ever revealed have as their essential purpose, we will recognize that it is guiding us through different languages and metaphors to recognizing all human beings as one soul. To me, this quote is an epitome of listening so deeply to sacred texts beyond beliefs, beyond dogmas, beyond claims, listening to the deep reality of religious texts with connectivity, with openness, in a way that is harmonious, you're probably noticing, with all the aspects of coherence. This kind of deep, receptive, connected listening is something that we can practice. We need to practice every day. We need to develop our skill for that every day if we are to survive the fragmentation and the chaos and the rigidity, the clashing rigidities of this time. We know that dogmatic outward practices, simply, religious or other, simply do not deliver us. Um, and here, another quote by a young man who was later named the Bab or the Gate. He was 24 at the time. He was of aristocratic Muslim descent directly related to the Prophet Muhammad when he spoke the following words in the early part of the 19th century. The revelation of God may be likened to the sun. 
no matter how innumerable its risings, there is but one sun, and upon it depends the life of all things. The revelation of God may be likened to the sun. The revelation of God runs across all the spiritual traditions of the world, all the scriptures. Those are different risings, but it is one sun. And upon that understanding depends our ability to recognize ourselves as eternal consciousness, eternally evolving towards oneness, through all the realms of reality, including this realm. So for us at this time of religion as ideology, to connect to this underlying reality is difficult but essential. And here, a very central point to which I will return separately in a different lecture the role of heart in all of that. Ironically, it is the activation of heart that in fact fosters the greater coherence of mind. <coughs> the research on that I will speak about another time, but I would just like to say now that it is unquestionably the activation of the heart that propels in the most transformative way the deeper integration of mind. So when Karen Newell is putting together her sound meditations, she's actually working with sound frequencies that activate heart. But when you think about the nature of our relationship to the unknowable essence of life, to the essence of prayer and meditation and our relationship it is a love relationship. It is a relationship of love with, to, for that unknowable epitome of beauty and truth out of which all multiplicity emanates. That love relationship, as it becomes deeper and is more consistently cultivated, in fact, brings about deeper and greater coherence of mind across all these characteristics that you have on your sheet. And so in that line of thought, in that Baha'i spiritual understanding that began to emerge in the early 19th century, um, a very important premise was and has been that religion must be living vitalized, moving, and progressive. That if it is without motion, if it is no longer progressive, it is dead. It has lost its divine life. Because we are created with the power of reason. And it is through the power of reason that we search for truth. And we recognize beauty and harmony. And the heart rests in that which makes sense and which the heart can trust. The heart cannot deeply and truly rest in something that it cannot trust. And so we have to begin to think about this thing that we refer to as religion that has so badly divided us as not a set of beliefs or customs but really dynamic practices and teachings that are the very life of the spirit that inspire us for in us high thoughts and high aspirations that refine our character, that lay the groundwork for our living and acting with greater and greater nobility each day. And so the spiritual language is essential. It is important to realize that up until the 19th century, um, the understanding of the mind 
and the need to cultivate the mind boiled down to the need to train it. And this is very beautifully captured in Hindu and Buddhist scriptures, which I'd like to quote here. Uh, the Dhammapada says, the mind is wavering and restless, difficult to guard and restrain. Let the wise man straighten his mind. Again, the mind is wavering and restless, difficult to guard and restrain. Let the wise man straighten his mind. And the Bhagavad Gita, for him who has conquered the mind, the mind is the best of friends. But for one who has failed to do so, his mind will remain his greatest enemy. So until the emergence of Baha'i spiritual understanding in the early part of the 19th century, our best understanding of what we do with mind was that we discipline and train it, we focus and redirect it, and a lot of spiritual practices were dedicated to that, profoundly so, and very effectively so. In this new emergent understanding, we're starting to realize the multidimensionality of cultivating mind. And so I'm going to close this lecture by handing out to all of you, or I, I have 20 copies again, a little selection. Um, you will actually see the title is Spiritual Language That Cultivates a Coherent Mind. And I have listed here the uh, eight or nine characteristics of the coherent mind that form the word coherence. And against each one of them, or most of them, I have actually selected a little one-liner from this most recent spiritual tradition that to me seems to foster through language that particular process of mind. Uh, you can do a lot of research both in in the Baha'i spiritual language and in the spiritual language of all of, our, of your traditions and see how they speak, how these languages speak to connectedness, to openness, to harmoniousness. But right now, I'm going to encourage you to come back in your groups and I'll pass around uh, these, uh, this single sheet for each of you again. Make sure everybody has a copy. Um, and you can read please together with one another and uh, I know you've already been doing that in your groups um, and so let's give everybody an opportunity to benefit from the insights of the smaller groups of course we all know that we are gathered here people from very different practices and convictions um, and so somebody was asking, well, what if, what, if, uh, what if a person does not have a spiritual practice of their own or doesn't even feel comfortable thinking in terms of a spiritual practice, uh, which is really a wonderful question. And there may be people here in this room who have to uh, ask themselves that question for their own experience. I think that's why we're having this conversation about mind and, and looking towards coherence and looking towards activating heart so that we can all reflect on what that involves for us, what we have in our lives, what we recognize that we need, what we feel we don't need, and to just listen to each other and learn from each other. So we are open to all possibilities, and it'd be nice to hear from more people. So please, um, can you share? Yes. And in your name, please, start with you. Yeah. I'm Kurt. Kurt. Can I respond to this business about not having a spiritual uh, or a, a religious sure. orientation? Sure. Because I've been thinking a lot about this lately. Mm. And the way I think about it is worldview and religion are the same thing. So if you say, I'm a psychologist, but I don't have a religion. I think, no, you have a religion. It's called psychology. And it has certain premises which yes. can't be challenged. Yes. And if they are challenged, then everybody gets fidgety and they want to, mm. whoever's challenging them, they want to get them out of the room because you're undermining my religion. Mm. So even if you have a, a, a you, you were in a scientific discipline, 
and you say, well, I have no religion. My view is you do. You have a worldview. It has certain premises. And when people approach those premises and start to knock them down, mm -hmm. if you get fidgety, then you know that's your religion. <laughs> that's how I think about it. Thank you. Thank you. That was, uh, that's definitely wonderful, uh, a wonderful reminder that we all hold, can hold our worldviews in a way that we can experience as religious and the way that you're using this term is rigid. Uh, and we can hold our worldviews in ways that are generative and open and, and bring about uh, the possibility for growth and deepening. So, but we all have a worldview. Therefore, we all have some kind of ideology slash religion. So thank you. Let's keep going. What, what else have your groups generated? Please share insights, observations. Yeah. Please. Um, so Jessica and I talked about when we experience coherence. Oh, I'm, my name is Dominique. Yes. Um, and I think that it's when we're in flow, like, you know, how, as we talked about earlier, and um, when we're very present and we feel connected to maybe another soul recognition of um, higher knowledge or something mm -hmm. like this. So um, it could be learning or teaching or interpersonal relationships. And, um, and then in relation to how we felt when we read the quotes, yeah. Um, I think that we felt that they were very thought-provoking mm -hmm. and they um, stimulated an openness as mm -hmm. we were reading them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Krasi. Uh, we had a very nice discussion in, in our group. Please say your name loudly. Krasi. <laughs> Krasi. Uh, we had a very nice discussion in our group. We talked almost about all of the, um, the quotes here. One that particularly strike me or our discussion about it was um, emergent, I am but a tiny seed which mm -hmm. thou has sown in the soil of thy love. We were talking about how tiny the seed is but how big the potential of this seed is mm -hmm. if it's sown in the right soil. Mm -hmm. And then in that from this comes also our free will. We choose in what soil to put this seed. Mm -hmm. so that it can develop its full potential. Mm -hmm. So we can have a seed like an acorn that can, that can become like a big oak mm -hmm. if it's sown in, the, in a fertile. Mm -hmm. in the fertile uh -huh. Thank you. Yeah, could I just take that metaphor just one more step, kind of mm -hmm. my biology. And your name, please. <laughs> Earl. I was thinking about, and all that potential that's within that seed depending on what soil you put it in, but it's also dependent on the energy from the sun to grow and could be that connection with all the, the other minerals and nutrients around it, and other sources of energy for it to really grow into its full potential. Mm. And, and that's a wonderful metaphor for us all, I think, going back to connection. And mm -hmm. And the need for sun. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Shirley? Oh, Juno, Juno, yes. I just wanted to add to what Earl was saying and Krasi, because this, this question happened in our group. Um, Noetic has the description of self-sustaining. And we had a discussion, well, okay, if we are self-sustaining, then we are by ourselves, but all throughout we've been talking about how we need the community and others, and exactly how Earl was saying, we have a lot of potential, but we are within a fabric of the universe. Mm -hmm. So understanding that and taking in and giving in that fabric is very important. Mm. Wow. Thank you. Shirley, and then... I want to add that I guess um, one of the things that's important for me because I can get into my head too much is that um, most of those only made sense to me as experiences. So noetic and knowing that is not just a belief that we get fidgety about, but you, mm. you are comfortable. I mean, you know it. Uh, 
it's sort of it's through the heart. It's not an intellectual or just intellect. It's not divorced from yes. something else that uh, sometimes seems ineffable. But um, so that uh, even contradictory. So the one, but you're many. You're you're connected, but you're sick. I mean, there's, all of that mm. seems to be, yeah. It makes sense when you're out of your head. <laughs> yes. <laughs> out of your mind. That is precisely why I chose that language and you noticed that I actually didn't have selections for, for everyone because that was just my last minute. I just, some things just stood out for me and I, they struck me, certain words just struck me as illustrations experientially, not as a concept, not as a belief system, not as uh, any kind of belief system, but just experientially, noetically. They struck me and others, I had no time to look for something that really connected to my heart. So, and, and you're welcome to do that yourselves, but it's really important for us to ask ourselves, what are these languages that noetically bring within us these experiences? And do we have such languages in our lives, in our days particularly? And if we don't, perhaps that's something we need to be looking for as part of our a path towards coherence. John over here, right? And yeah. then Vazu. <laughs> if I'm allowed to sort of pick up on your <laughs> minds in strange places and the sun, I am uh -huh. so much chagrined to admit that as I thought about this, what came up for me was a, a, the quote from Albert Einstein that most of us have probably heard, mm. the unleashed power of the atom, the, mm. the power of the sun has changed everything save our mode of thinking Mm. which oh. gets into mm. our and we thus drift towards unparalleled catastrophe mm. cheerful mm. Albi <laughs> but what, what I hear there is that our mode of thinking if it does not become coherent mm. the fragments we will destroy ourselves mm. Mm. Well, that's what bubbled mm. up thank you that's cool. that's, thank that's you powerful. yeah Awesome. So we, we, we only talked about the first one and we were sort of slowly moving forward. <laughs> Something that, uh, that you had said earlier on about the qualities of the mind and one of the qualities you said was witness. Yes. The um, ability. And I, it, it, it was... The ability to be aware, to bear witness. Aware, yeah. bear witness. <laughs> it's interesting to me that sort of two of the most recent world religions, both Islam and uh, the Baha'i Baha faith, in sort of the, uh, the the basic prayers that all believers are enjoying mm -hmm. to say, talk about this idea of bearing witness. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So in, in Islam, it's sort of basically you, you bear witness that there is no God but God. Uh -huh. um, and in uh, the Baha'i writings, you bear witness that God has created you to know and to worship. So this idea of bearing witness mm -hmm. you know, in the mind seems to be very central wow. to who we are and mm -hmm. our experience of knowing you know, who we are, our purpose, and all of these things that we are. It's so interesting that two different world religions have, you know, of course, if you believe they all come from the same source, it makes sense. But even if you believe these are, you know, separate religious traditions, this idea uh, comes forth. And with that, I was thinking, uh, with this particular set of quotes, one attribute that is not talked about, but connected to this very witness is humility. Mm -hmm. That if you're not intellectually and spiritually humble, then you're you know, you will never uncover. So for us, I think it's, it's not false humility in the sense that, but it's, it's genuine humility to know that we don't know, that there is this mystery that we are trying to unlock. It is, it is that, and that's what this bearing witness mm. does, mm. that you bear witness that you're this one small, wow. tiny speck in something, you know, yeah. and that's what the seed analogy or some of the <coughs> other ideas talk about is, uh, if, and when you approach the state of mind with that curiosity, genuine curiosity mm -hmm. and humility, then we uncover um, wow. great things in the universe. Thank you. I'd like to very quickly uh, connect the uh, early part of, of my talk to what you were just saying, Bazu. It struck me as you were talking about the humility of bearing witness that I was reminded that Dr. Eben Alexander was describing precisely that. He was bearing witness, his consciousness was bearing witness to these multiple spiritual realms and the evolution of consciousness interconnectedly across these realms. And uh, there was great humility in the way he was 
accounting for that experience, which was completely different than the scientist before the coma who thought he knew. Mm -hmm. He had answers, but after the experience, there was this tremendous humility because he had borne witness to a mystery which he had no language for, but was just really trying to give us a feel for. Mm -hmm. So it's very much connected to what the prayers ask us to do, which is really a way to perhaps prepare consciousness for the reality of its evolution across the spiritual realms, which is just such a mystery that we can only bear witness, really. So thank you. John. I want to thank you for that comment, because in our group we're discussing it, once we read it uh, through all of them, I was struck with a profound sense of humility. Mm -hmm. And oh, wow. I, I don't know why, it just, mm -hmm. that was the moment. And we had a discussion around that in our group, and, uh, oh. among other topics. And that, but wow. It just, it was a moment of not knowing. Mm. Wow. Because we all think we have answers. Mm. Wow. Thank you. This is so rich, friends, and it's already 10 minutes of 8. It's so hard to end this conversation. <laughs> Shall we take one more comment before we end? And then we'll have to very quickly reassemble chairs. And... If there's nobody, <laughs> I can add something. Um, I want to go back to not knowing, uh, being, being humble, in a way submissive to God's will, and not knowing, and at the same time, looking at noetic, and the quote here, does thou think thyself only a puny form? Mm. When within thee the whole universe is folded, turn thy sight into thyself that you may see me standing within thee, mighty, powerful, and self subsisting. Yeah. So, not knowing at the same time, this tiny seed with the potential to unlock the mysteries, the divine, mm. or um, have a glimpse of the, of the divine um, mysteries. You know, this was a wonderful closing comment, and I'd like to connect it to uh, what I said at the end of my talk, which is that it is the activated heart that actually appears to propel the greatest coherence, growth in the coherence and integration of mind. When we experience this moment of bearing witness to the mystery, to not knowing, but to also loving and being drawn to this mystery. Our hearts are activated. And in this act of love and humility, something happens with our minds and the ways that they align themselves and all those differentiated pieces relink and reconnect and, and form a deeper integration that from that not knowing, a deep noetic knowing mm -hmm. emerges. It is not final, it's not answers, but it is a knowing that comes from the activated heart.